Hey, everybody. Welcome in. Another new edition of Celtics Beat with Tom Westerholm, who, of course, covers the team and uh, other teams, for that matter, as kind of a general assignment guy for Boston.com. And, of course, Evan Valenti, producer, sometimes host of this program. Welcome in. Good to have you with us. Not a ton has changed in the wide world of uh, Celtics basketball since our last show with Keith Smith, where we really went deep on all things Olympics and Jason Tatum and Ime Odoka and many other things as well. But that's kind of good. It's kind of exciting, guys, because it allows us to bounce around here, tackle a whole bunch of different things beyond our uh, off-air show just prior to coming on where we really r- ran the gamut, I think. How are you both? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Certainly Absolutely. don't have any bees in my yard, which was a topic <laughs> of discussion for your show. So I'm happy about that. That's right. The excitement of home ownership. Uh, you know, we, we can't imagine team ownership, although we touched on that as well. That's, you know, that's Wick Grosbeck and Steve Paliuka's problem and, and, you know, other minority owners and everybody involved. We can get to some of obviously the, the decisions that that group is facing here this offseason. But I, I think what is uh, what, what's really appropriate for right now is this is it's you know i'm seeing it on social media guys it's yet another opportunity for us to go in the way back machine look back at that 2013 draft and lament man celtics could have had that uh that giannis guy he 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 seemed pretty good back then giannis and tentacumpo in the bucks 2-2 with the suns right now in the nba finals and that man is otherworldly tom i mean the block obviously is is incredible i mean and the thing to remember too is like this guy was injured what like like you know a couple weeks ago like it like yeah. and he's and he's still just doing everything I mean he, he's amazing he's so much fun to watch and like um I, I, somebody pointed out on Twitter yesterday I don't remember who it was so I apologize but um that it's it's pretty cool that like the best player of the last decade like his signature moment is a blocked shot and now you know you don't know where Giannis's ceiling is but if he's the best player of the next you know five to ten years or whatever it is you know, maybe his signature moment will be a block as well with uh, with, with that last night. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, Celtics missed. <laughs> maybe they should have drafted that guy. All due respect to Kelly Olenek, of course. You know, it's, it's, it, it's really like rating your children, but which block? I mean, whether it was the Giannis chase down or obviously what we saw from Giannis as we talked here last night, which one was more impressive to you? You mean the LeBron chase down? LeBron chase down. What did I say? Oh, you said Giannis. Yeah. Oh, but, yeah. Well, I, I just assume he's going to do that at some point in time. Too. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm sure the, the LeBron chase down. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's definitely the LeBron chase down, right? I mean, it's yeah. like a a game seven, like you know, a real game saving play. But I mean, you know, the, the Giannis one. I mean, the degree of difficulty like may have been higher, right? Like it's like the to be you know one foot above the free throw line and everything like that to to, to reverse direction that quickly. Just the the length, the athleticism was incredible. I mean. I think, you know, the LeBron one certainly was more, you know, I, I guess higher stakes uh, at, at yeah. that stage, but Giannis's was too. Like if they lose that game, they're probably losing the series. So it's uh, maybe not quite as dramatic, but it's plenty dramatic in its own right. I think I'll, the only thing I'll, I'll point out is I think both guys are like one of one guys that could pull off those two yeah. feet like separately. Yeah. I don't know how many guys other than LeBron, maybe Kawhi could do what LeBron did in that you know particular game seven there against Golden State. And then I don't, I don't know. And I actually think Giannis is, I agree with Tom, like there's a little bit higher degree of difficulty here. Um, I don't, maybe like Bam. I mean, I don't know anybody really that could have done that. That's, that is a truly unique unicorn one-of-one type scenario where only Giannis is the only man on the planet that could have done that. So just taking that at face, like those are the only two people in the NBA at those times, or even like further, I mean, there's just not many people that could have done that ever. So it's well, think, pretty remarkable. Yeah. I think our guy Kendrick Perkins said on TV earlier this morning, there were probably three people on the planet that could make that play. And we don't know who the other two are. <laughs> that was, that was basically what that thing looked like. It was, it was nuts. And really, you know, not just obviously coming from where he came from, like you brought up Tom and, and changing direction, getting there The even once he did change direction, you look at where that ball was in the air to where he needed to go the speed at which he just totally eliminated that gap was unreal like even it's almost less believable when you watch it in slow motion than watching it in real time yeah I mean for sure and I think you know to to that point about who could do it like like maybe go bear right like but even him like you don't I don't know that he's got the mobility to get there like because I feel like a big part of it was the fact that Giannis is so big like if he's not that tall and that long I don't, you know, however fast you are, however high you can jump. Like you said, the, you know, the ball was inches from the rim, uh, you know, when, when he was turning around. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he, he really is one of one. I mean, we'll see what happens. I think the, 
there's there's that uh, kid. I think his name is like Victor Wembayana or something like that. Put um, the words out of my mouth, Thomas. He maybe the only other guy uh, that yeah. can pull that off. <laughs> yeah, like he's you know yeah, similarly you know gifted both you know physically and athletically and everything. So you know maybe a couple years down the road we're looking at him in kind of the same way. But for right now, yeah, I think. Gobert has probably got the size. I don't think he's got the mobility. I think there is one guy in the NBA who could do that. And uh, he did it. So pretty good. Well, then he pretty gives good. us that unbelievable post game quote about, uh, you know, <laughs> leaving both, uh, both those last games early in the first quarter and go back and take a tinkle. <laughs> yeah, I mean, guy, guys just too he's hydrated. Just so, he's so pure. He's so, I mean, he's, he's clearly a kid at heart. He's just, you know, happy to be there and not happy to be there in the, in the sense that we usually use that term of like, oh, he doesn't care if he wins or loses. I mean, he's just totally like embracing the moment and all things that that include being on this stage. I guess I kind of wonder, I'm trying to think of the right way to ask this question. You know, thinking about Giannis from a marketing standpoint, the guy is incredibly marketable. He's one of the faces of the NBA. We know that. But there's such a difference between like he says and does some things that you would never see out of a LeBron or some of those guys like, you know, LeBron different stage of his career, obviously, but you know, for a long time, it's, you know, you've, you've had him uh, with, with his school, you'll have him obviously weigh in on, uh, on racial inequality and, and BLM and things that have happened in the world. Giannis, it's like, not to say things like that don't mean anything to him, obviously, but you know, you got the tinkle moment. You got him putting a picture up of him flexing on, on Twitter the other day, but the caption was like, and I almost crap myself. And the, uh, you know, you think back a couple of years ago when, when he was talking about, you know, there was real sexual conversation in terms of like a bell, his then girlfriend had given him and that sort of like, he's just, it's, it's really a, there's, it's almost like there's a generational gap in, in maturity, not to say Giannis is immature, because I don't want this to come out the wrong way, but he's he's obviously just at a different stage of life where he's so fun loving that that I wonder what the NBA's sort of approach is when when it's looking at like you know marketing one guy versus another. Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah, I, I wouldn't necessarily say maturity. I think it's just like different personalities. Um, like I think yeah, like he, he seems to be a guy who you know is maybe a little bit more easygoing, and I think one of the things that helps with that is you know LeBron when he was in high school, he was already on the sports illustrated cover. Like he has mm -hmm. been just like swamped by media attention, his whole career. Giannis came up with, like all throughout his, you know, his, his formative years, like his, you know, when he was really young, I mean, Jonathan Gavoni like went out and visited a couple of times. You know what I mean? Like there wasn't really any media attention. Yeah. He gets drafted. There wasn't, I mean, he was like, people were interested in him, but there wasn't the same type of buzz like the first year or two he plays in Milwaukee, you know, there's, there's good writers out there, but it's just not as, you know, media heavy as some of these other ones. I think part of it might just be that like LeBron is so just like swamped with media attention constantly ever since he was 16. Giannis just isn't as much like he probably feels a little bit more free, a little bit more free to maybe be himself. Like we know, you know, we know LeBron, you know, likes to have fun. He likes to have fun with his family. He posts about it all the time. You know, Giannis, I think, I think he's just able to be a little bit more open because there isn't necessarily the same weight of, you know, hey, everybody wants an interview. Everybody wants to talk to me right now. You know, it's just that even though he is, you know, like this similar in terms of, of talent and in terms of impact on, you know, his team, it might be a little bit different in terms of uh, just the just the pure attention that's focused on him. Yeah, just to just to make this like sort of Celtics related at this point, because we've talked a lot about Giannis and how great he is. You look at Every year when the finals happens, you sit back as a team that's not in the finals and you say, man, what do we need to do to beat one of these teams? You know, what do we have to do to beat the Lakers? What do we have to do to beat the, the Warriors? We're chasing them or et cetera, et cetera. You look at this finals and you have the Suns and the Bucks. And I'm not trying to – the Suns, I love the Suns. I think we've all adopted the Suns at this point because they're so much fun to watch. And after the bubble last year of them going 8-0 and, and then, you know, not making the playoffs to this run has been just tremendous. I love watching them. Eaton has been – just fun to watch develop. I'm a huge Mikael Bridges fan. Um, and then you have, you know, the Bucks on the other side with Giannis, who's just stupid good. And then Chris Middleton, you just, if it's, is it a Chris Middleton game or not? You know, we're trying to figure that out still, whether he's going to be on or not. But you look at these two teams and like normally you say, okay, we're chasing these, the Celtics are chasing these two teams. But it's one of these years where I can't, I don't think we can quite say that. I still think, you know, at the end of the day, you're still chasing the Nets if you're an Eastern conference team and if you're in the West, I think it's a little murkier and the Lakers are obviously up there. The Clippers if Kawhi stays in the South, they're up there. And you know, we're not, it, that's a little bit muddier. So 
what do you make of this in terms of, you know, you, you sit back, you try to analyze this time of, you know, what moves do the Celtics have to make? Do they have to make moves to catch up with Milwaukee because Giannis is a whole different animal now, or is Boston still chasing a team like that? I, I don't, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around where Boston needs to pivot based on what we're seeing in the finals. What should they do? Yeah. I mean, it's a really good question because I think the other way to look at it is sure. Like there's the nets, there's, there's these really good teams out there, you know, like teams might not be chasing a specific team right now. You know what I mean? Like, whereas previously, yeah, like everybody's chasing the warriors, everybody's trying to, and like, you know, it almost felt like a hopeless cause because they had KD clay and Steph. Like it was like, yeah, how are you going to catch them? That just isn't the case with, I think, any NBA team, like even the Nets, like they have the talent to be that way, but you don't know if they're going to be healthy. You know, you just like, there's so many question marks about them still. I think obviously they'll, you know, be better gelled and everything next year. But I mean, they played eight games together this year. Like, I I don't know that we're going to see a team that has a ton of continuity um, just based on injuries. So maybe you're chasing the Nets, but I think realistically what you can do now is you're kind of free to just build the best basketball team you can. And you know, whatever, whatever direction that takes, it's less about, I think, chasing a team and more about just, you know, as generic as it sounds, just chasing a title. Like you're just, you're just trying to like that. That's, that's what worked out for, for the Bucks and the Suns. Like they just built good basketball teams. Like, I don't think either of them was focused on trying to beat somebody else. They were just trying to, you know, complement their best pieces. Both teams really did that. And, you know, both teams caught a couple of breaks, but so does every team on its way to a title. So I think it's just kind of about putting yourself in the best position, um, you know, <laughs> This is to, not to sound too much like Brad Stevens, but put yourself in the best position to be the best team that you can and, uh, you know, hope that that works out from there. Hit singles. Hit singles, man. Yeah. <laughs> who do you think just, and I know we'll pivot off of the finals, obviously we've already started, but who do you think wins this best of three at this point? Oh man, it's so tough. I, I think the Suns are a better team. Um, it's just hard to like pick the Suns coming off a loss like that, where they could have could have put it away like if they win that game I know that you know everybody will want to make three one jokes especially because you know Chris Paul has a history of of not being the best playoff performer necessarily but like I mean I'll stick with the Suns but like that's it it, that's kind of about more about sticking with my guns than feeling like confident um just because like yeah they they had some real chances yesterday and they just blew them and that's you know that's tough on the psyche I feel like so yeah I'll I'll go Suns but I don't feel good about it I'm right there with you. I I probably feel disturbingly good about it actually, but maybe that's just because I had Phoenix and six coming in. I'm I'm hell bent on sticking to that. Not that I, I think it'll go the distance. Now I don't think either team's going to take the next two. But uh, on Chris Paul, because you brought him up, and Evan and I, we were talking about him before we came on. Just the you know what is for years people have been you know tooling on Paul, making fun of his contract. You know one of the worst in the NBA. Look how overpaid he is, and then obviously. He just goes from team to team to team, and and not to say that he has them all on the cusp of, of a championship. This is really the the first one, but they always get better. They always get better upon his arrival, especially in the regular season. The playoffs, maybe they fall short, but in the regular season, there is a a marked improvement upon Chris Paul's arrival. Well, now Phoenix is looking at a, a forty million dollar player option for next year. And you have to wonder, you know, at a guy who's going to be 37 years old, do they bring him back? Do you, if, if you're Phoenix or even another team, do you look at trying to work out something that obviously is a lower average annual value, but over say three years, you know, I just think his, not that it has any direct impact on the Celtics, I realize, but I think his situation, his contract, him as a player in general, it's all just really interesting in the scope of today's NBA. For sure. I mean, I think you definitely like if, if you, you know, obviously it's, you know, he said it's a player option. Like, I think if he wants to come back, he, you, you bring him back, like fine. Uh, all these guys are young, you know, they're, they're in the finals right now with a chance to win it. I don't think anybody's getting antsy to leave. You know, I don't think there's any question that Devin Booker is going to be there for the foreseeable future. And Deandre Ayton is still on his rookie deal. So like, yeah, I think if Chris Paul wants to, wants to stay, I think you definitely keep him. And, you know, then you can make your, your decision the next year, you know, when you've got another year of um, kind of information on how he's going to age. So, yeah, I mean, I think, the success that the Suns have had this year buys them kind of as much time as they need over the next like year or two to kind of establish what they're going to do. And then, you know, maybe figure out what the the post Chris Paul plan is going to be. Yeah. It's funny. I just think that even, you know, if if he opts in on that 40 million bucks, which uh, most of us would, I think a lot of people are still going to be saying, and you're paying him what, you know, even after obviously 
what he's done over the course of this year. But one guy that uh, none of us are, are complaining about his contract, we celebrate it on a daily basis. We pray to it, for, as a matter of fact, and that's Jason Tatum, who, uh, as we know, a building block, one of the pillars, his new head coach, Ime Odoka, has referred to him many times here for the Celtics. Those two guys working together, he and Jason Tatum, out uh, at the Olympic preparation in Las Vegas, getting ready for Tokyo, which begins in just a couple of weeks, even less than that at this point, I think. Uh, a couple more exhibitions before they get going with uh, that tournament. As we know, Tatum is dealing with knee soreness. Now, that's not necessarily something to be alarmed by, but by the same token, uh, I, I think, you know, we sort of, it's, it, sort, it sounds sort of tacky to say, but, you know, we as sports fans, like we always put our teams before country when it comes to this type of situation. Like, yeah, it's, it's great. You know, win the gold for, for USA, go America, but God forbid, Jason Tatum gets hurt along the way. And then all of us are going to sit there and go, well, did he have to be there? Should he have been there in the first place? The year he was coming off of the short turnaround from last off season, COVID, all these things. We talked a lot about it, obviously with Keith Smith last week, but I don't know. What's your mindset as it relates to to Tatum going through what he's going through right now and, and the way in which Greg Popovich appears to want to use him? Because I think Evan put it well last week saying, it seems like pop and USA, they kind of want to make Tatum the face of this team. Yeah, if not the face of this team, then certainly I think it seems like they want to make him one of the faces of the future, right? Where it's like, he's, I think he's the youngest guy on the squad, right? Like on the main squad. So he's, he's obviously he's, he's really young. He's a star. And this is something that clearly means something to him. You know, he was talking about that. I think that's, to me, that was because I, 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 like, from a purely logical perspective, I agree completely with Evan. I, I, I think that like, you know, he's not, like it's it's tough to like he's coming off a really really hard year a really hard two years and you know now he's gonna like play basketball in the middle of it that that matters like I I get the concerns but I also think that like this is something that clearly means a lot to Tatum and how many opportunities is he gonna sorry guys how many um just invite the dog to to be part of the show it works obviously obviously the pooch has hot takes on Tatum (laughs) um We'll work through it. Go it's on. all good. Don't worry about it. Apologize, man. fellas. We all um, love dogs here. We're all big dog fans. <laughs> yeah. It's all good. So, I, yeah, I, I think I'll like invite mine down. They can talk to each other. Yeah, they can. They can have a real conversation. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, I just think like this. How many opportunities do you have during an NBA career to to be an Olympian to try to win a gold medal? You know, all of that stuff. Like it. Um. It, it matters quite a lot to these guys, and and uh, you know, it clearly matters a lot to Tatum. He talked about how it left a sour taste in his mouth um, that he couldn't play at FIBA, and obviously. There were some real failures with that FIBA team. So, um, you know, I, I think it like, obviously like good for Tatum for wanting to do it. Good for team USA for identifying a superstar young talent and, you know, trying to bring them on. Um, yeah. I think I understand like why Celtics fans might have some concerns, but I, you know, I think there are only so many chances that you have uh, to do this and, and Tatum's taking one of them. So. Yeah. I, I'm, you know, I saw the injury news and I got a little nervous and I'm like, Oh my goodness. Like what the, I, I can't deal with more injuries after this entire season. I just can't do it. I have like, you know, I, I just have, I have a real fear of it because I, this team had a really rough year and they don't need to get off track to start the next season. They need to be right to rock and roll as soon as, as soon as the season starts to try and flip the karma, this team's trying to flip, but you know, you look at, at, at what this team is, 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 and it, and it, Again, I'm not the only person to say this. It reminds me a little bit of the Celtics, you know, throughout the regular season, this team USA, who can't figure out quite the chemistry things. And obviously, you know, there's, they haven't played that much with each other yet versus some teams that have, you know, played for years with each other. So there's a lot, of, a lot of continuity there, but you look at this team and you look at what they might be able to accomplish and you have potentially recruiting things going on. And, you know, the connection with the EMA, again, it's just, it seems like, and I've come around to this, there are way more benefits to Tatum playing um, than, 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 you know, if everything goes right, then to him, like missing this particular experience. But now we have this like Brad Beals in the COVID-19 protocol thing. And again, I just get, I get nervous with, with, you know, should this team, should we even have the Olympics right now? Like with what's going on, do we have the Olympics? Do we send, I mean, I know they're not going to have fans, which is going to help out, like I'm, I'm, but you know, with the way that vaccinations are, you know, it's, are it politicized in this country and, and how, mm-hmm how divided people are like i just I've, i really don't think on well, the variant this, too it's not like we're past yeah, this it's just it, it just doesn't make a lot like i understand like the ability you gotta have the, like, 
but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to do this right now. And all the things that are happening, I just continue to say like, this doesn't need, we don't need to do this at all right now. This doesn't need to happen. Like I know there are benefits and I understand the benefits of working with Popovich and learning from Durant and all this stuff. But like, does this need to happen right now? Can we just, I don't know, Tom, I'm, I'm still skeptical of this whole experience. That I get it, man. Like I, I really do. I mean, I, I was, I was skeptical of the last year of NBA basketball. Like I didn't think it should happen. And, you know, I mean, how many guys got COVID and, you know, Tatum was talking about how he needed to use an inhaler for however long, like, yeah, I like, it all feels like a bad idea. Um, but if, you know, if we're plowing ahead with this, I guess, then uh, I understand why Tatum wants to do it, I guess, more than anything. Although I guess, you know, one thing to think about too, and I'm just sort of thinking about this for the first time now, but do we, do we think that, I don't know if you're a player and, and we can make it about Jason Tatum or any of the others. If, if you're there as part of the Olympics and it, like clearly because of what's going on still in the world, there's strict protocols that these guys and, you know, men and women ac across whatever sport they're, they're there, you know, participating in and trying to win gold. And they're, they're under such strict protocols that, you know, it's, it's a lot different, you know, since we know so much of the world is back to normal and, and people are feeling back to normal and go out and live your lives and do whatever you want to do. I almost wonder in some ways if if being part of the Olympics and, and being under those restrictions that you're not under in your day to day life, uh, unless you impose them upon yourself, obviously, is is a benefit. Like if if and I don't know what what Tatum's day to day would look like if he weren't obviously in Vegas and then, you know, country to country and, and Tokyo. But if he were, you know, just like left to his own devices, free will, uh, you know, would, would he live his life? Uh, you know, more, and I, this is not the right word for it, but more, you know, recklessly meaning like, ah, w whatever versus obviously the, the restrictions, like I said, that he has to follow as being part of this thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that was the, uh, that was the argument, um, you know, for a lot of these guys, especially in the bubble, right. was, you know, that these, uh, that if you're in the bubble, you're, you're more, you know, like you're about as safe as you can be. Cause you're again, right. you're literally in a bubble. So, I mean, you know, it, the bubble worked, you know, so like, so that's good, I guess. I don't know. It's, <laughs> that's all well above my pay grade at this point. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I certainly understand concerns on, on the other side. Um, and I, and I, I get why Tatum wants to do what he wants to do. It, it's really hard, man. Like, I think that's one of the lessons of like the last like year and a half or whatever, is that there isn't always, you know, a good option. Like there isn't always, there isn't always like the right choice to make um, in that way. So yeah, I, 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 I can feel for these guys because, again, how many chances do you get to play in the Olympics? Right. And also, like, how do, how do you keep yourself safe and, you know, keep everybody else safe? Like, I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. So it's tough. Hi, guys. Cedric Maxwell here. I want to take a minute to tell you about Marigold Medical. I'm used to keeping my body in great shape. But with arthritis, even the most simple everyday task became unbearable. As soon as I called Marigold Medical, I knew I was in good hands. No drugs, no surgery, just an experienced team of caring professionals that wanted to get me back to doing the things I love. Make the call to Marigold Medical and get back to pain-free life. Let's keep talking about Jason Tatum a little bit. I thought he uh, had some interesting comments not, you know, overly polarizing or anything like that, but some interesting comments with uh, one of your colleagues, Gary Washburn, obviously at the Boston Globe, talking to him in the last few days about uh, the Olympics, about Ime Odoka, about his relationship uh, with Jalen Brown. A lot of people have had thoughts on, you know, whether those two can coexist uh, on, an, on a championship team, whether they take away from one another. And uh, personal comments, you know, Tatum is not typically one of those guys that, uh, will make headlines with with things that he says. He's not a, a controversial guy. He tends to stay out of the fray. Uh, Evan said pregame he's kind of very Tim Duncan like in that way. He doesn't you know necessarily uh, grab at you with uh, you know with like it, it should be me. I should be this. Blah blah blah. But to say to Gary, you know that that he seems outright pissed that he wasn't All NBA uh, and and not considered one of the 15 best players in in the league last season. Maybe some of that. I'm sure a lot of that is financially driven, even though he said it wasn't about the money. 
I mean, money comes into play when you're talking about literally tens of millions of dollars if you're recognized as one thing versus if you're not. But it was interesting to hear him speak out. And it's interesting to think about even a guy who is as young and as successful already as he is in this league, that Tom, he could start next year with a, a decent sized chip on his shoulder. Yeah, I mean, I so I, I don't know exactly what to make of the the, you know, the money stuff and like the, the all NBA comments, I, my read on Tatum as a, you know, as an interviewee is that a lot of times he is pretty honest with you. He's just also pretty low key. Like, I, I don't think he necessarily like holds a ton of stuff back. It's just that he's, you know, he's, he's a pretty chill guy. Like he's, this he's more like a really boring way. <laughs> no, I don't even mean boring. I think he's just like chill. You know what I mean? Cause yeah. like when he's funny, he's genuinely funny. Like he, he can be like very um yeah. Like he, he can be an interesting guy to talk to. So like, I think, you know, from, from what I can, I think all NBA mattered a lot to him. You know, we know all-star mattered a lot to him last year when it was going to be his first one. He, he talked about it. He wasn't, and you know, he, he always, he always pointed out, I think quite accurately that he wanted to win primarily like winning was the number one thing, but also making an all-star team matters and making an all NBA team matters. And it, you know, it matters to be, um, you know, kind of uh, acknowledged for the good work that you do. And I, I think that's, I think that's where he's at. I think he felt like he was an all NBA guy last year. I think he was, you know, right up there in terms of, you know, in terms of production, in terms of talent, all that, obviously, um, you know, so I, I to me, it kind of came across as more just like, yeah, I, I wanted to be all NBA. Like, yes, obviously winning matters more. And yes, like the money would have been nice, but I think Tatum knows like, okay, like I've got life-changing generation changing money coming like forever. Like, yes, like obviously that money hurts, but you know, the NBA isn't his only revenue source either. He, sure. he loves his, he loves to do his, his commercials. He loves his subways, Rakuten, all that. Um, but Maybe. like, you know, I, I think for him, the big thing is just like, yeah, I, I had an all NBA season and I deserve to be, you know, recognized for that. And that's kind of hard to argue with him. Like he, he did, like he had a, like, certainly it's hard to kind of pinpoint like, okay, I would have taken this guy off. I would have put Tatum on over him, but like purely from a production and from an importance to his team and all of that, yeah, he, he was he was right up there with everybody else. Yeah, I want to I want to double down. With, I think I think Tatum. Well, first off, I've never lost out on thirty million dollars before, so that must suck. <laughs> right? uh, that, hurt. that 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 hurts me just as like a fan. I'm like, man, that that that's a bummer. <laughs> um, but I but I do think that Tom Tom is onto something here. I do think Tatum like, and I'm not sure that if craves is the right word, but is like looking for respect in a certain way, but in his, and it just like wants to be on the same level as his heroes. Right. As the guys that he's like, he, he's like, I want to be in the same sentence as Kevin Durant. I want to like, and his, and the all NBA is the next step to getting the same sentence as Kevin Durant and Kobe Bryant and all that stuff. And he just, he's trying to break ceilings here. And I think he takes it personally when he believes in his mind. And I, and like, look, I, you can make a lot of arguments that Jason Tate should be not only on the third team all NBA, but like, I look at what, and I, look, I'm not trying to, to, to speak ill will of Julius Randall here, but, and they had a great season and they won more games than the, the Celtics did. So that, you know, can easily do that. But if you look at statistics, I mean, Tatum had a, just an, an incredible year, especially given the fact that he had COVID and had to come back from it and was dealing with that for a while. So, but I think he craves, and I think that he is looking for the recognition of like, yeah, I'm just as good as all these guys. And, and, I mean, it, it's coming, it's all coming and he wants it is, you know, as soon as he possibly can. And I just love the fact that he's using it as motivation to fuel him for the next thing. And maybe that's part of the reason why he's on team USA right now is like, I need to be able to show everyone that I am this good and that I am ready to take the next step. And that I am one of the top 12 people in the NBA and that, you know, when it comes down to making a shot at the end of games, like I'm on the handful of guys you want taking that shot and you're seeing it sort of reflected now with the you know i think uh it was released by a bunch of people i'm not sure who had it first maybe mark sign i i don't quite know but in the nba released the, the information but like clearly tatum is a very popular player amongst fans number five in jersey sales amongst all players in the nba the second half of the season so you know you look at the fact that he's getting at least recognition from fans as a guy that's like taking that next step and is going to be part of this young generation of superstars which is going to be a ginormous pool of talent when we think about the entire nba but I think he's just like, look, I'm better than all these guys. And I love the attitude, right? And I love the fact that he's quiet about it. And, you know, you look at, like, there's a lot of, uh, you know, stuff about Luca and how he's not really happy with Dallas right now uh, and Zion and New Orleans. Like, it seems to me that 
Tatum is on this level of maybe like John Morant, who's a guy that's sort of low profile in a way. And maybe Tatum's even better than that in terms of like Morant's dad is uh, just a funny character in general. Um, but you don't hear from any like Tatum, you never really hear from. And I enjoy that. And like the silent assassinness of Tatum is, is fantastic. But like any motivation to, to fuel Tatum to the next level. I am here for all of it, Tom. I need I need people to start taking swipes like, oh, Tatum's not that good. He's the reason why Team USA stinks. Like, I need all of these things to come to a head. So Tatum takes the next year and just says, like, okay, this is my team. This is my – I mean, he talked about it with, with Washburn, too. Over the years, they've had so many guys that are now and Tatum and Brown are the last two guys left saying, like, okay, it's clearly our team at this point. And all I'm saying is basically at the, at the end of this thing is I am excited the next version of Jason Tatum and that's why I'm so nervous about Team USA because I want to see when the when game one happens I want to see what Jason Tatum looks like in 2021 2022 without any injuries or any screw-ups prior to it well definitely and I think you know you can look at it both from an attitude and from a schematic perspective right like he's from a schematic perspective as the year went on he started getting to the line way more and that is literally like the key that unlocks everything for him offensively like if he gets to the line eight, nine times a game, he's unstoppable. And he averages like 30 points a game. And like, that's, it's, it's pretty much that simple. And then, you know, you look at the attitude stuff and it's like, you, you talked about, uh, you know, taking like taking slights and, you know, kind of reaching the level of his heroes. His hero is Kobe Bryant and Kobe Bryant, you know, like would use anything like to, to try to, you know, as a slight or any kind of motivation he could like, you know, I, I think Tatum, there were questions about him last year, about his leadership, about his style of leadership. And when those started to surface, I mean, he got really good. Like, I think, I think it was right around that time that he scored 60 points and that he, you know, he started putting up these ridiculous stat lines and he scored, you know, 50 to send the Celtics to the playoffs. And um, when he scored 50 to send the Celtics to the worst first round matchup they could have had instead of <laughs> falling to the Sixers. But yeah. um, you know, like he's, yeah, I, I think he's, I think he's that guy. I think he's, everything that you want from a young superstar i think he i think he's i i kind of think he's he might be 11 right now you know what i mean i think he's top 10 um you know right in that conversation as a 23 year old he's, he's everything the celtics could hope for and i think yeah like building around him at this point is um you know it's not just like what they it's not just like what they obviously should do it's that what they should be focusing everything on to me i, I think you um you know you hire, you hire somebody like Ime Udoka because you know Jason Tatum respects him. And, you know, you, you bring in – maybe you bring in a player or two who you know is friends with Tatum. Like, I, I, think, I think he's at that point with the organization where um, – or at least I think he should be at that point with the organization where they're like, yeah, man, like you're – whatever you want, let's, let, let's figure it out and let's, you know, let's try to build a good team around that too. All right. Well, you've written about it. Others as well. What does this thing look like? Because we're about – two and a half, almost three weeks away from the start of free agency. As we know, Brad Stevens elevated to president of basketball ops. So they'll build this thing in his vision, at least to some degree, more so than Danny Ainge with him as an, a, a consultant. But obviously, Ime Odoka, the head coach, is going to have a say in this. But it is very clearly, as it was last year as well, but, but now in a time of turnover, it's very clearly – Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown's team. You have Mark and Smart as a foundational piece as well. I don't think he's going anywhere. I think if you, you know, definitely listen to Brad, listen to Ime, I think it, it becomes that much more apparent that Marcus Smart's not going anywhere. But building this thing out, what does this look like this offseason? What should the main priorities be? I think that it, there's two things that I think the Celtics are really going to need to take a look at. Number one, I think obviously from last year, what we saw is they need more veterans. Um, they have to figure out a way to like build that up. And I think that's something that Brad Stevens is going to want to do. Like, I think, um, you know, like we can't know for sure. I don't think Brad will ever tell us, but I, I think that he probably would have preferred to not have as many young guys over the last, you know, two, three years so that, that he had to try to work into the rotation that, you know, he had to try to, um, build a contender around like it's hard to build a contender with like role players who are all that young so I think that was one of the major problems last year so I think the Celtics will probably my, my guess would be they would they would probably take a take a hard look at you know maybe trading some of the young guys and seeing what kind of veterans they could bring back or um, you know that type of thing and then I think you know I, I think the Celtics it is probably time for the Celtics to take some big picture looks at, at what this team is at you know going forward they have an entirely new front office an entirely new coaching staff you know, I, I think there's I think there's an opportunity here, maybe not this offseason, maybe before the trade deadline, whatever it is, um, you know, build this team up, see what it can be. But like, I think, you know, be ready to pivot, because if if this thing doesn't work, like 
what you really don't want to do is is waste this opportunity with two young stars who are both wings, who are both you know incredibly valuable players. Um, you know, you, you can't waste this. So whatever you do, like, sure, if you want to kind of run it back, um, you know, with a with a very similar core for this season with some veterans and see how it would look. I think that makes sense. But I also think like be ready to be nimble. That would be, I, I think, what what they need to do over the next few months. Like keep a close eye on it, see how things are progressing. And if it isn't progressing well, you know, be ready to question, you know, what what be ready to question what's next. Cause I think those questions are fair at this point. Yeah, I think I think the bench is obviously the biggest, the biggest question mark here. And like you talk about filling out the coaching staff, they fill out some more guys and 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 we we have no idea what this is going to look like. I'm excited because it's new blood, fresh blood to see what it looks like, different perspective, all those things. And, you know, how they, how they handle, you know, each guy in their assignments, like Damon Stoudemire is going to, you know, primarily probably work with Marcus Martin, Peyton Pritchard. And, and, uh, and we'll see with, y- is it Yamadar? Am I saying that right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, I, guess I, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens there. And, and it's, this team needs, to find its identity again, I think. I think last year they had a sort of identity crisis and they've they've switched things up to change their identity. So now I think they have to find a new one. And what does that look like now with Jason Tatum as a centerpiece is a very interesting question. Um, you know, I, I, I love some of the guys they've been able to draft over the years. But now it's time like to see what they really have. Like, okay, Romeo Langford, you have one more shot here to try and figure out what the hell your, what your NBA uh, career is going to look like. Um, but, you know, you look at, the end of the bench and you look at, you know, potential, you know, uh, targets, so to speak, that they, they might look at, like some people are obsessing over the backup point guard spot. Um, some people are obsessing over the fact that they have a, a real lack of, of big depth outside of like Al Horford and, and Rob Williams, who, you know, Rob gets hurt quite often and Al's up there in age. And after that, it's Moses Brown and Grant Williams playing center. So, so if, you know, if you were, you know, Brad Stevens, president of basketball operations, or, you know, we'll see whoever ends up in the GM spot, whether that's Allison Feaster or whether that's going to be Landry Fields or whatever Mike Zarin is, <laughs> like, I don't, you know, I'm quite sure. Uh, what would be your primary, you know, is, is it re-signing Evan Fournier? What's the first thing that you think you, that the Celtics need to get done? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's re-signing Evan Fournier. I think that's, that's the big one. Um, and then I think number two, yeah, like you touched on it there. You need to figure out what you're doing with Rob Williams because he has obviously he's he he can get a contract extension you might be able to get some real value for him obviously you know you're concerned because of like all the injuries and stuff but like i i imagine rob and his agent probably are too right like that they are also looking at this landscape and thinking like okay like you can roll the dice and if rob has another like if rob stays healthy and has a season similar to the one that he you know to, to the flashes that we saw this last year he's probably a 20 million a year guy or like, you know, something close to that. Like he's making a ton of money. And if he isn't, and if he isn't healthy, I mean, he's making a lot less than he would this off season. So I think, I think you can, you have a chance now to, to kind of evaluate what you want to do with Rob evaluate. Maybe you get like really good value on a starting quality, big man who, you know, has a really high ceiling. Um, I, I think that's a really important question too. I think, I think the primary one is Fournier because, you know, like, like Fournier just adds more like scoring punch more. It's not quite star power, but it's like sub star power. If that makes sense. Like he's like, he's like right there, but not quite like he adds that little bit of punch that you really need. Um, so I think he's the most important, but I think, I think a close second is, is what to do with Rob because the potential is there to have a super high value player on a super value contract, you know, or, uh, you know, spend a bunch of money on a guy who can't stay on the floor. Like it's, it's a really tough question. And I think that's a really important one for the Celtics. I don't know if you feel this way, but definitely some people that we've talked to on this show and outside the show seem to. Do you think it's a a foregone conclusion that Fournier is back in Boston? A lot of people seem to feel that, that is the case. And I do wonder, I guess maybe it's just me being influenced by those that, that again, we've heard from. But I, I, I'm starting to wonder exactly how sought after this guy is going to be or if Boston is just willing to not overpay, but, you know, pay him high market value to bring him back versus you know kind of giving him something right there in the middle and and challenging him to get more elsewhere yeah i mean it's tough like because because he's not you know he's not restricted so like if you give him something in the middle and challenge him to get something else elsewhere if he gets it then he might just bounce like he might just be kind of like annoyed that the celtics were um you know trying to lowball him um so 
Yeah, I mean, I think I would, if I were the Celtics, I would probably try to offer him something like mid to high market value and just like let him know like, hey, like, you know, we really value you. Like, this is kind of where we have you. Um, you know, we would love to bring you back. But I mean, he is, he is kind of tricky in that way. Like, you don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to commit too much money for too long to him because you don't know how much substar value he has. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I would be very surprised if he was elsewhere. I think that the path for the Celtics to acquiring you know, his level of talent um, is really difficult without re-signing him. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a complicated conversation. I, I think he'll be back, but, you know, well, the, the, the number is going to be really hard to nail down. What are you thinking about Yamadar? I know Evan brought him up before, obviously, and, and there's a lot of excitement about him coming over to, uh, you know, we don't know if he'll be on the team next year, but come over to participate in summer league and just get our first look at him. Obviously people look at the highlights and it's easy to fall in love with the guy, but you know, anyone can fall in love with a highlight reel, like people on social media the other day. And, and maybe it's just our, our guy, greeny being greeny, but people falling in love with the, you know, Carson Edwards at the gym playing pickup. Like we know that highlight reels are, are very different from going out and, and doing the job and performing at, at the highest level at the highest stage. I mean, Carson Edwards couldn't, you know, the, he's, he's known for a, a huge three point performance in a preseason game in Cleveland. He's done nothing to speak of since uh, what, what do we expect out of Madar uh, when, when he comes over and, and what his game, you know, does to, to translate to the NBA? Yeah, I think the translation is the really interesting thing because the tools are all there for him to be a pretty good player. Like he's a, a good defender. Um, you know, he's obviously like you see the highlight passes. Like he's a really flashy passer. He's got he's got a really good court sense. And I think, you know, the biggest question mark with him was that before last season he was a bad three point shooter and now he's a good one. So, like that that's really promising to me. And I think if you watch, you know, his his shot, it looks smooth. It looks good. It looks like he's got real range on it, you know, not just the three-point line, but probably a couple feet beyond it. Um, you know, I, I think the amount of stuff that he can do lends itself better to the NBA than maybe somebody, you know, like Carson, who, you know, like always kind of struggled around the rim in college. He was never like a great finisher. Um, you know, he was kind of a, a spark plug scorer. Like that was kind of his one thing. Whereas I think Yam has a couple of other things to his game where the, the, the shooting and all that came around a little bit later. And he shot, you know, 40% on a good amount of, of threes last year. So I think you can feel pretty good about that translating, even despite some of his struggles when he was younger. But the fact that he is kind of like a, you know, a ball hawking defender, the fact that he, that he is a really flashy passer and that he gets other guys involved. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of tools there that, that could be really good. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really curious to see it at Summer League. I think there is a chance that he has a, one of those Summer Leagues that people get like way too excited about. Hmm. Like, I, I don't think he's going to be like, you know, starting for the Boston Celtics next year or anything like that. But I do think that there is some, some potential for him to make some waves and to look like an interesting backup option um, if they're willing to take on, you know, another young guy onto this team. Yeah, Summer League is always fun. Summer League overreactions are the best. I am one of the guys that usually pushes that narrative because I just enjoy watching young guys, you know, compete and, and you know, make a name for themselves and, and try and, you know, use Summer League as a springboard or something that's going to be better. And I, I'm actually – kind of amped for this summer league team um, mainly because we haven't seen it in a while just because you know yeah. pandemic and things but sure. there are some interesting names like I guess Pritchard's gonna play a little bit I don't think Pritchard should play at all in summer league I think he proved yeah. that he could hang I don't think that's really necessary but a guy like Neesmith um, like I, I would like to see Romeo play a little bit yeah. um, you know obviously Carson and Tremont and, and some of the other guys are good that are gonna play I'm obviously very, and then Brown. what's up Moses Brown, right? Moses, I mean, yeah. again, Moses should probably play. I mean, that guy should definitely, you know, get some PT. Um, and then whoever they pick with their second round pick, if they go that route, I mean, we'll see if anybody else ends up on this roster. And, and we look at, you know, who could be available in the, the mid forties and trying to sell, sell yourself on, you know, somebody's highlights. I mean, I like, I, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but Joe Weiskamp from, from Iowa is currently uh, my favorite guy at that spot, just because I think they could use a guy that could shoot 40% from three off their bench. But you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, you know, uh, Luca Garza is another guy that could be potentially there as teammate. So um, you got any favorite guys that in, in those mid forties time, or if you not, if that's too early for you right now to, to start talking about that stuff. Oh no. Yeah. I got favorites. The the number one guy is, is Herb Jones for sure. Okay. Uh, from, just like a, like super versatile guy, super versatile defender, like great size. Like I, I really like him. I'm, I'm, I'm like lukewarm, uh, no pun intended on the, uh, on the Iowa guys. Um, 
that might be my own uh, bias. Like they both come from the same like region that I did. Like Weiss Camp's name is like, it sounds like every dude that I went to high school with uh, in, in <laughs> Iowa. So like, I just kind of don't believe in him, but like, that's, you know, not fair. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not as high on them, but I, I, I think, you know, somebody like Herb Jones would be really, really intriguing. I think there's, I think there's some, some real upside um, with him in, especially in the modern NBA. So he'd be who I'm looking for, but to your point about the summer league team, I, I agree completely with everything you said. Like, I don't, I, I don't necessarily see the value of Pritchard even showing up. Like we kind of know what Peyton Pritchard is. I think one of the nice things about summer league for somebody like Romeo Langford is it's an opportunity for him to play basketball and, and kind of like, like almost like find his niche again, you know, like he, he had his, his niche on Indiana. He's obviously, you know, was, had his niche with all of his high school teams in the NBA. It's just, it's so hard to pin down what he is. Like, are they trying to develop him into like a spot up shooter? Like he's got a lot of work to do if that's the goal, you know, are they trying to develop him into like a tough one-on-one -on -one defender is he this like pick and roll guy that, you know, that we saw in, at every other stage in his career? Like, can he do that at the NBA level? Like playing in summer league gives you the opportunity to figure those things out a little bit against other professionals and with guys who you might play with. So, I mean, I, I see a ton of value in Romeo playing, you know, Neesmith, all of those guys. Um, but yeah, like Pritchard's the one that doesn't necessarily make as much sense to me. So um, yeah, I'm really excited for summer league too. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but as far as the draft goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me Herb Jones. And, uh, if you can't get him, I, I don't even know, man, like trade the pick, see who else, <laughs> see who else falls. Like there, there might be some guys who, who are kind of interesting from the first round who fall. I don't think, you know, I don't think BJ Boston is going to be around at that stage. I, I know he's fallen into the second round on a lot of mock drafts. If, if they have a chance to take a flyer on him in any capacity, I definitely would. I know he had a really tough year at Kentucky. Uh, he's one of the better high school players I saw at like the hoop hall in the last like, you know, five, six years. Like he's, he was, he's really, I don't know what's going on with him, but like the talent is, is, is really, really high um, with him. So um, I would definitely take a flyer on somebody like him if it's available, but yeah, it'll be, uh, it's, it's going to be a fun couple of weeks here. I'm, I'm excited to see uh, how, how this shakes out couple things uh going back to Pritchard I guess just to be a devil's advocate here a little bit and, and look feel free to tell me if you think it'd just be a total waste of time I, I'm in agreement with both of you in that I don't see any value in, in Peyton Pritchard being there playing in games but what about being there and participating in practices being kind of a a young leader in the sense that you know he's already been through it clearly he's established enough to not you know, that you can easily make the cases you guys have that he doesn't need to be out there playing in, in summer league games. But, you know, as a guy who could be kind of a, uh, again, for lack of a better term, sort of camp leader, a guy that young guys can look, you know, look up to. He's, he's young enough in his career, obviously, one year under his belt that it's not like he would take it as a sign of disrespect if he was sent there to Vegas to, you know, to be part of it, to be kind of a, a mentor. He might even embrace it and help his own leadership skills in that sense. He could be there as, as kind of a, not that he knows Ime Udoka at all. It would be more of a thing with Brad Stevens, but he could be kind of a, a bridge to some degree from the coaching staff to the younger guys who are just going through this uh, either for the first time or just, you know, kind of finding their footing a little bit more than they have in the past. I guess I, I can just see some value if we were to look for it anyway, some value in Peyton Pritchard being there. I don't want to see him out in the court participating in summer league games, you know, for fear of injury and whatever else. I just don't also, as you guys said, I don't think it's necessary, but if he's out there in, in drills and, and just sort of around and an ear for guys who are looking to get comfortable with the NBA lifestyle, I, I could see the value in that. It's funny the way we talk about like four-year seniors, right? Like that he's, right. I mean, he's in his second NBA season and his first one was pure chaos. And we're like, maybe that guy should be there for leadership. I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I, I think he's uh, like, I, I could see that. I could, I could see some, some, some value there. Um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting because like, I, I don't know how much Pritchard is, is going to be asked to be a leader, you know, next, next season. Like the Celtics have leaders, like, like, you know, mm -hmm. Tatum, Tatum's a leader. Jalen's a leader. Smart is certainly a leader. Like, you know, I, I think he at this point, um, there, there's probably some value in, in having him try to try to be a leader and just in terms of like, what does he look like three or four years from now or, um, you know, that type of thing. So, yeah, I mean, and the, and the other thing, too, is like, like, you know, I think a lot of guys might not want to go to summer league um, just to kind of be just to kind of hang around. Uh, right. I don't know that Pritchard has much of a life like outside of basketball. So like that's like it's probably fine if uh, I'm sure he would. And I guess hanging out in Las Vegas isn't the worst thing in the world either. So, 
yeah, I mean, if, if he wants to do that, sure. Um, I, I think there's value there. But I think in terms of like the on court stuff, in terms of like the guys who are just working on, you know, developing their games, I do think the focus needs to be on guys like, you know, Langford and Neesmith and just mm-hmm. guys who, if, if those guys can contribute next season, that really helps the Celtics a lot. Like that makes, uh, that makes a big difference or, you know, not for nothing. If, you know, if somebody like Neesmith has a really good summer league, maybe his trade value goes up or maybe, you know, yeah. Langford's trade value goes up. Like those, those things are all valuable too. So um, that would be my focus, but I, I could see the argument for just kind of, you know, having a guy around to, to be there and to even just to have continuity with, you know, whatever assistant coaches is working with them. Segues well into my other thing, which is going back to the draft. And, and obviously what we were just talking about, there's more than enough young guys on this team. And, and like you said earlier, I don't think Brad Stevens uh, dreams of having even more young guys on this roster than he's already got. That being said, what likelihood, if any, do you see there in being uh, him trading into the first round? You know, if, if there's, I don't know, we don't know who he likes, doesn't like, maybe there's a guy that he, that he does desire. Who's kind of a, a mid round guy or, or even potentially a late round guy. What are the odds that, that Brad makes that move after obviously trading away their uh, lone first round pick in that Walker deal? I wouldn't say it's high. I think, you know, if you're, if you're looking at this team and, and you're kind of like evaluating what they need, I think, like you said, one of the last things they need is another young guy. Like mm-hmm. I, I think they're much more likely to put the focus on, you know, down the line, like, like what veterans can they get? What, uh, you know, what pieces can they get around there? I think taking a flyer on a guy at 45 makes sense. I think that I, I wouldn't be surprised if they take, if they use that second round pick, like that would be, um, I, I think that would be my strategy, but end of this first round, like, unless you can get into like the top five of this year's, you know, lottery, I don't necessarily see a ton of reason to move up. Like there's, it's super top heavy. And then there's some guys that you might like, you know, in the first round, there's probably some like some, some high value guys that we don't know about yet. Some guys that, you know, will surprise us, you know, your, you know, your, your Donovan Mitchell types where they, and not, maybe not to that level, but you know, your guys who were liked, but weren't necessarily considered like, you know, star level guys. Maybe there's a couple of those guys in the mid first round, but I think this, I think this draft in that way is kind of hard to pin down. Um, so I would, if I'm Brad, I'm not, I'm not touching the end of the first round or the middle of the first round or whatever. I'm just take 45 and then, and then see what veterans you can get. And uh, you know, start evaluating next year. I'm just eager to have a year. Where we're not talking about the Celtics adding four draft picks. <laughs> it's, it, it's a lot more relaxing for me. I will say that like as, as a draft guy, um, I'm this, this year is, uh, is much more peaceful. Last year was stressful. Other years have been stressful. This one is, uh, this one's as low impact as it gets. Yeah. I, I can see maybe trading up into the second round to try and get someone that they had a first round grade on that fell to the second I mean, I don't, again, you know, you mentioned BJ Boston, and I think the other guy, um, like highly touted guy that didn't do so well, is a Jalen Johnson on Duke that like just quit after like seven games or whatever and just didn't play. Um, you know, maybe trying to get somebody like again, I know I have no idea if he's going to fall out of the first round or not, but you know, there could there's going to be someone that does, and everybody's like, what, didn't Xavier Tillman go in the second round? Right? Wasn't he like the yeah. or? Yeah. So it's somebody like that where you're like, this guy should have been a first round pick. I can't believe he didn't like in now Boston might be able to move up and, and try and get someone like that. Take a, they might have a favorite guy like that, but we'll, you know, we'll see. Um, but yeah, this team doesn't need any more young talent. They did their two best players are 24 and 23. So I don't think they really need more young guys need guys to show them the way, which is why I'm so excited about the Damon Stoudemire thing, because at least you have a guy who uh, on the bench, who's really been there, done that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm pumped for this, for this off season. I just can't really kind of wait. It, it, and as much as I enjoy the finals, I think the team building stuff is just so much more interesting when it's right. Like when it's right there and you can like, like, yeah, let's get to the finals. So we can start talking about this other thing. Like that's, especially when um, you know, the, there's, I mean, I'm not saying there's like a lack of star power because I'm enjoying it, but you know, when your team's not in it and hasn't been in it for a while and you're just starving for news like we are, like, it's just a little bit different. I mean, I'm enjoying the finals. I'm not trying to say I'm not, I, I, I'm anti people that are like, well, LeBron and Curry aren't in it. It's not fun. This is, this is amazing. But when the Celtics bow out in the first round, I, we haven't had a lot of Celtics stuff to deal with for a very long time. And just for the content alone, I need Celtics stuff to happen. Okay, guys. All right. No, we all have podcasts. We, we, right. we need right. content, guys. Like, help us out. <laughs> Who would be a more effective depth guard for the Celtics next season? Carson Edwards, Tremont Waters, or Damon Stoudemire? Oh, I mean, I, 
I, I'm not ready to give up on Carson Edwards yet. I, I still think there's like some some scoring potential there. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not super high on where Tremont on what we've seen from Tremont Waters. I know he's had some moments, but yeah, I mean, you know, like I'm I'm not ready I'm not ready to give up on Carson yet. I I think he can be I think he can be a bucket. Um, he's he's only a couple of years into his career. Um, you know, we'll see. But yeah, it the early returns aren't super me promising. Must. Take me take me back to my childhood. I do, I do miss Damien. I do miss Damon Stoudemire. He was a lot of fun. Man. All right. Well, uh, as, as you said, we've all got podcasts. Anything you'd like to plug my friend? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, listen, I, I've got a, a podcast with Nicole Yang and Chris Grenham. Uh, it's the, uh, the Geno time podcast on the blue wire network. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I work for boston.com. I have a, a story on, uh, uh, Marcelo Mayer, uh, the uh, Red Sox uh, first round draft pick, uh, yeah. stud shortstop. Uh, so got a got a little little story about him over on Boston.com. People can read if they want to, um, you know, if they want to talk about the boys of summer instead of the the Celtics. So yeah, that's uh, that's what I got going on right now. That could be a happier conversation right now. The way that team is going. <laughs> Of course, uh, Evan always part of this show. Me more often than not as well. But Tom Westerholm, thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely, thanks for having me on, guys. All right, another show next week. We'll see where Tatum stands, hopefully healthy with regard to all things Team USA and the Olympics. They will be right around the corner at that point, not to mention the draft and free agency approaching as well. We'll do it again next week. Thanks for listening. Rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. We should tell you much earlier in the show when you're actually listening. We'll talk to you later.